Welcome back, AP. Welcome back to a welcome back to your flip classroom. And it was a great time meeting y'all today, right? It was so much fun meeting y'all today. I'm really, really excited to start this new year with y'all. Really, really attack and get after this stuff. Speaking of attacking and get after stuff, the big thing about it is we had a really, really weird schedule today. We only had like 40 minute classes and stuff like that. So I didn't really, really have, like, I do not have enough time to record a brand new flip. But lucky for us, we have a nice short flip that I used last year, right? So like, and it's actually really, really good at explaining some of the early humanists and some of the stuff like that, some of the early secular humanists in particular. So it's going to really kind of start right after the Petrarch stuff. And it's going to really, really get into like, you know, different figures like Boccaccio and Ficino and Brunei and some of these early humanists that actually might not make a lot of really, really big waves, right? Might not make huge, huge waves like some of the other ones that we're going to talk about a little bit later, like Machiavelli and Castiglione and Erasmus and Sir Thomas More and stuff like that. But these little guys are still important because you need to be able to recognize their names when they pop up, even though like their ideas are pretty much like kind of borderline flashcard stuff, right? So the big thing about it is go ahead and watch this. I hope you all enjoy. I'll see you all soon. Yeah. And then it was becoming a religious order, or it was getting away from its original ideas of religious order and things like that, which is going to help lead to the Reformation. We'll talk about that a lot in class. A lot of kids love the Reformation, and I enjoy the Reformation too. It's really, really cool. So the big thing about though getting into it is this is our first uh, secular humanist, and these guys will go by very, very fast, right? So Boccaccio is a big one, right? Boccaccio was the, an Italian historian, and as we can tell, he is a very, very famous Renaissance author when it comes to it and down to it when it comes to being a humanist because he's got his laurel wreath, right? He's got his laurel wreath, or you'll always see them with a red Renaissance cap on their head, which is a little like flat guy, which actually demonstrates their intelligence as well, right? So Boccaccio, the Italian historian, wrote a very famous book known as the Decameron, which he is holding in his hand right there. The Decameron is a history of Florence during the Black Death Plague, right? So it's going to talk about Italy and particularly focusing on Florence during the plague, right? Now, this is important to note because in 1347, we got guys like Dante like living right around the plague, right? We've got people like Petrarch being born right after it. And so Boccaccio becomes one of the very first ones to come along and record a history of Florence and Italy during the actual plague like fronts itself, right? When the Black Death was sweeping through most parts of Italy and also through most of Europe and killing 50% of all Europeans up to that point. The other big cool thing he's gonna write is gonna write a text on famous women, which is really, really awesome. Like, good for you, Boccaccio, being progressive and stuff like that. I like it, right? And then getting into it a little bit further, we've got this other guy named Leonardo Brunei, right? Which I saw his grave site over the summer, which is really, really cool. Leonardo Brunei is a very, very important figure because he was the very first one to actually sit down and also become a historian and divide history into like the three distinct chunks that we talk about now, right? Ancient or antiquity, medieval, and modern, right? Those are the big ones, right? Sophie Panzavecchia dropping that word antiquity the one day was really, really impressive, right? So the big thing about it, though, getting into it is you have to understand that that ancient, medieval, and modern sectioning of history is really going to be a Leonardo Brunei idea. And also another funny little thing is that he absolutely loved Cicero, right? Big fan of Cicero. And he loved to like translate a lot of his texts. And the thing about it is like there's a lot of famous Cicero texts. There, Cicero has so many thoughts and theories on government ideas, economic ideas, and all of this stuff being an ancient Roman when he was alive. Leonardo Brunei comes along as a Renaissance thinker and he starts translating all these things and he translates most famously one of his like famous speeches of this like thing about uh, this guy Catiline who was about to try and like overthrow the Roman government and stuff like that. And Cicero had this big speech where he tried to expose him and they prevented that guy from actually overthrowing the government. And so Leonardo Brunei liked Cicero so much that he actually linked the decline of Rome to the, uh, to the decline of Latin following uh, Cicero's death. He was like, oh, the decline of the use of Latin and the actual integration of more like uh, barbaric languages or Germanic languages or other languages that like existed outside the empire and Greek as well is actually going to, he believes, linking it to the downfall of Rome, right? So now that's a very interesting thought process and idea and it's a very, very good way to go. And there are some correlations between those ideas. And Leonardo Brunei was alive in the 1400s and he's like actually analyzing these things. And also remember, none of this stuff that we're talking about. Boccaccio is not focusing on why God was angry during the plague. That would be a non-humanist idea. Leonardo Brunei is focusing on the studying of human history, right? That's a humanist idea. We spent a lot of time kind of talking to Delilah yesterday about like uh, explaining humanism, right? Talking about like your foot and your forearm and like how big it is and stuff like that, blah, 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 and like all of these different ideas.
experiences of becoming a person who studies the lives of which we live in now and we rather than focusing on the lives that we will live after we die, right? So now another big thinker that comes along, very, very important, is this guy named Marsilio Ficino, right? Marsilio Ficino is actually so important because he was like an early tutor and an early like, uh, like actual, what's the word I'm looking for? Early role model for the young Michelangelo, right? And like, actually they knew each other pretty well when Michelangelo was a young man and he was coming up from a, being a very young man and was actually like working some early stuff for the Medici, making some of his early sculptures. Marsilio Ficino was actually a very close, um, like the patron th or thinker patron by the Medici family um, because of course he lived in Florence as well. And he's actually, they're going to like interact several times and he's going to help progress his thoughts and theories and ideas, right? And so Marsilio Ficino is a Florentine humanist, which means he's from Florence, okay? So like it's patron by the Medici family, specifically Lorenzo il Magnifico. It's going to do a lot of work when it comes to the thoughts and theories of Plato, right? So Plato and his ideas, of course, were going to be lost to time for a very, very long period following the Middle Ages and following the decline of Rome. The concepts and ideas of Plato, and especially one of his most famous texts known as the Republic, are going to get translated into Latin, and then they're going to get translated into Arabic when the Muslim thinkers get a hold of them, and it's going to get bopped around and moved. And so Marsilio Ficino begins to translate the thoughts and theories of Plato from these old texts, and he begins to read create this thing known as Platonism or the idea of Plato's thoughts and theories using rationalism and other uh, kinds of means of like philosophical thought to try and rationalize your way around certain ideas and like end up philosophical questions, right? Platonism is going to actually come in and he's even going to try and like reinvent Plato's Academy, right? So Plato's Academy was a very, very important place. And for the, the person, I think it's Inyasha who has uh, the School of Athens, your like piece, your actual like art piece takes place in the actual Plato's Academy, right? This piece right here, as you can see, all these Renaissance thoughts and or like all these um, what's the word I'm looking for? Ancient thinkers. There we go. You got Plato right here, Aristotle right there, Diogenes, my favorite. Her uh, the Her or oh, wait no wait, what's his name? He's like the somber one. He's the one that I'm going. That looks like him. Uh, so Heraclitus right there. There's Pythagoras down there. There's Ptolemy down there. There's all these different thoughts and like these different um, like ancient thinkers and ancient pre-humanist thinkers, the classical thinkers right here in your face. And look where they are. This is inside of a place known as Plato's Academy. Plato actually, when he was alive in ancient Greece, founded a place known as his academy, and where he would actually try to put forth a lot of different thoughts and ideas and theories and try to use his ability to teach his concepts to as many people that were willing to come look into it and as many people that were as coming, willing to come and learn as possible, right? And this is going to emphasize a lot of different ideas, and we'll talk about this when we look at Inyasha's piece and stuff like that when she's presenting on it and stuff. It's going to like a lot of, like, uh, like Marsilio Ficino, when he's translating Plato's works, talking about his academy, trying to reinvigorate the academy and bring it back, he's going to start emphasizing the ideal over the real, like the concepts of like where does perfection come from, does it exist, and he's going to be the very first one to really propagate the cave and the theory of forms. Now we'll talk about these two things in class, so leave like a couple of little spaces, like right underneath it, like two or three spaces, two or three lines underneath, and we'll explain what those things mean and Marsilio Ficino's ideas on their translations, right? We actually need time to talk about that in class because it's a little bit of a hard thing to explain, but it really helps explain all these different like platonic ideas and how Marsilio Ficino is going to translate them and then help try to push them forward as well as a humanist. Now the other big one that is like the premier renaissance man humanist is Leon Battista Alberti, right? Now really, really quickly, let me just throw this out there real fast just so you're not confused. Boccaccio, Brunei, Ficino, another guy that I cut out of this presentation named Mirandola, Alberti, these, these secular humanists, in a lot of way, we could kind of refer to as like our JV humanists, right? Remember we had our varsity ancient thinkers, it was Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, then our JV ones were like, and we had our like, uh, like our big ancient thinkers, and then we had our JV, uh, like JV ancient thinkers, which was like Quintilian, Epicurus, Tacitus, right? You could consider these early secular humanists in a big way to be like JV humanists, right? Like Dante and Petrarch set the tone that these guys followed in their footsteps, right? And Leon Battista Alberti is another one of those like JV level humanists that is very important because they took the ideas of Dante and Petrarch and kind of tried to make them their own a little bit. They just weren't as impactful as Dante and Petrarch, right? And Leon Battista Alberti is considered the image of like the premier Renaissance man, right? And Renaissance man in the sense of someone who is attacking humanism even 
even in their own life, right? Because he is not only a thinker, but he is a philosopher, a mathematician, an artist, an, arth or an author, an architect, a poet, a priest, a linguist, and even a cryptographer, right? And so what we're getting at with the image of Alberti is that he has so many things that he's good at because he's trying to emphasize the humanistic concept of living up to one's fullest potential, right? He's trying to be the best version of himself that he can possibly or potentially be, which is a massively important concept that we understand, right? That humanism is about the study of secular things, but in a big way, it's also about trying to live up to be the best version of yourself and version of a thinker that you possibly can be. And Leon Battista Alberti really, really actually put that, like, like demonstrated that to the rest of the Renaissance community. And you can even see it when you're walking around Florence, because this right here is the front of the, uh, uh, Pia, blah, blah, blah. this right here is the front, this right here is the front of the Santa Maria Novella Church inside of Florence, right? I took this picture of the summer while we were there. The Santa Maria Novella Church behind it is made up of a lot of old brick and stuff like that, but the front facade is actually geometrically proportional and is completely symmetrical, right? And actually, Leon Battista Alberti used mathematics and complex like mathematics to actually figure all of this out and make it so it could be completely symmetrical on both sides and that the patterns would match up as if you were to fold the thing in on the front side of itself, right? So like that's what we're demonstrating right there, is that like actually Leon Battista Alberti was not just a philosopher, not just a mathematician, not just a cryptographer and wrote in code. He also was an architect and a like very and used all of his skills to try and like make his like works better, right? Now another last kind of JV humanist that's super important before we get into some of our other big wig like civic humanists and stuff like that here in a second is this guy right here that we're about to talk about. Now does anyone remember when we talked about it over like over the uh, summer like flips and stuff like that? There was this document that was given to the Pope by Constantine, apparently, right? And it was this this thing. It was like called like it said that like oh the Pope gets the ability to rule over all of Western Christendom and can act as though he is a king and guide them on their moral journey, right? Well, that idea that the Pope has the authority in Western Europe was set down by what document? Anyone? Anybody want to have a guess in there? Anybody want to throw one out? Good job, Erla. I heard you over there, right? So, like, yeah, very, very good job. It's known as the Donation of Constantine, right? The Donation of Constantine was that document, that really, really old ancient text written by one of these classical antiquity thinkers and that of Constantine, and is going to actually say that the Pope has the authority in Western Europe, right? Well, the thing about it is, then comes along this dude, Lorenzo Valla, who is a secular humanist during this time period, who like actually comes along and begins to translate and read this text. And he realizes <gasps> that it's a forgery! That this document was never actually written by Constantine himself, and it was written by someone else to try and give the Pope authority in the Western area of like the old Roman Empire. That's a big deal, all right? So like, that's a very big deal. See what I mean by these Renaissance thinkers? Lorenzo Valla comes along and he realizes that the document was never real in the first place, which is gonna rock the foundation of the church and of political thought and theory going forward throughout most of Europe at the time. Now, speaking of political thought and theory, who was the Pope always struggling against when it comes to European governmental practice? The monarchs and the nobles of Europe, right? That was in, like, emblematic in our investiture crisis that we looked at, the investiture crisis that we actually reviewed as well in class yesterday during our warm-up and stuff like that. So it seems as though the government practice in Europe during the Renaissance is kind of like not that solid, right? It's pretty shaky. Um, it seems like there's a lot of groups vying for control and stuff like that. Well, a lot of that relates to a new wave of humanism that's gonna come out during like the 1400s, right? And that idea and thought and theory is gonna be known as civic humanism, right? So civic humanism begins to analyze the thoughts, ideas, and practices of governmental and educational bodies throughout most of Europe. Civic humanism tries to figure out how humanism affects the civic population as a whole, right? And so we can break it up into two kind of like distinct areas of like you know, specialty when it comes to civic humanism. You have education on the one hand, what are people learning, what are their thoughts and theories, and why are they learning these things? And then we have on the other hand, governmental practice and how those ideas work, right? And so the thing about it is, education and civic humanism is coming along 
the liberal arts are beginning to offer a broader form of study than the are specific like theologian and theological ideas that were originally being offered at a university during the medieval period, right? So the concepts of Petrarch are now eking in to the educational systems, right? But the big thing about it is these are mostly reserved for like the upper echelons of society. You were wealthy if you got a chance to go to a university and get an education and things like that. And so a lot of people were wondering, but how can I get my children prepared for this life? If I am a wealthy individual, how can I get my children prepared to go forward and become the thinkers, the Petrarchs, the Dantes of the new era, right? That was actually figured out by larger communities as well. And schools were beginning to pop up all over Europe, right? Humanist schools were getting into open that were offered to mostly nobles and their children and things like that. It's not like, you know, like a, like a, like a farmer was like sending their kid off to school yet. Like school had still not yet become something that everyone believed everyone deserved. It was still something reserved for like the elites, right? Which is really unfortunate. But this is a big element of the Renaissance though, is that the rebirthed ideas are now being created in schools for a wider audience, right? And the subjects that are being taught in the schools are Latin grammar and rhetoric, rhetoric, Roman history, political philosophy, Greek literature and philosophy. The earliest schools are gonna begin to open in Northern Italy around Florence and Milan and Venice. And then they're gonna begin to kind of cross over the Alps and open up in Switzerland and France and grow and grow and grow out of the university setting and begin to expose society on a larger scale to some of these humanist ideas that have been popping up during the Renaissance, right? Schools spread as far north as Germany and all the way clear over the Alps, like I just said, which is a very important concept, right? That this humanism idea is now spreading, right? And if education is spreading the Renaissance, or excuse me, if education is spreading, the Renaissance is spreading. And that means that life and concepts are changing. That means when people are getting together in society, they're getting together and they're discussing the thoughts and ideas of Petrarch and Dante. They're getting together and discussing the works of Alberti and Ficino. They're getting together and discussing the concepts that they're now learning and ancient texts and the thought and theory and trying to reflect on society as a whole, right? Well, that's going to distinctly change how people act, communicate, and function in society in a very big way, right? So how should people act in this new Renaissance era? Well, the very first guy to come along and try to figure that out is this dude right here, Baldassar Castiglione, right? And Baldassar Castiglione with his handsome little portrait right here that was actually done by Raphael, the same guy that did the School of Athens and that competed with Michelangelo, did this portrait of this famous figure, Baldassar Castiglione, who is going to come along and he's going to try and figure out a way to write a guidebook to how people should act during the Renaissance era, right? And his text was very famous and was known as the Courtier, right? And the Courtier becomes this guidebook of the discipline of the courtly gentleman, right? Of the noble child that has gone to education, received that humanist style education at a humanist school in whatever country or location he's in, and he can function as an elite in society, right? Now, again, this is still super screwed up because it's actually only being offered to the wealthy and things like that, which really, really sucks. But the big thing about it, though, getting into it is that we're looking at it as a concept of hopefully eventually it will like, like, like actually move its way down into the lower communities, which it will when we get to the Enlightenment, but it's going to take a few hundred years, right? But let's focus on one little thing right here, courtly, courtier. We keep seeing this word court pop up right here. What does that mean? It doesn't mean the modern context that you think it does, right? The modern context of the word court is usually re like review or referring to judge, jury, you know, like the concept of lawyers going into court and actually trying to function and see if someone is guilty or innocent of whatever concept, right? That's not what courts were during like the medieval period and especially not during the Renaissance period. But court parties and court things started during the medieval era, right? What it is, is it's when kings and queens would hold what they call court, right? And court is basically these really big parties and stuff like that. That would be going down where literally there would be music playing and people would be dancing and drinking and eating and hanging out together and literally coming together and sharing the things that they had heard, the political news of the era, the thoughts and theories. But it was an established group of people that were allowed to party with the king and queen, right? And so he wrote the courtier as a 
guidebook to how you should act in one of these court parties should you be elite enough or prominent enough to be able to go one to go to one right so according to Castiglione a man who admit, like brings himself into a court should be able to compose a sonnet and write poetry right play a musical instrument you should be able to wrestle which they're not wrestling at court parties it's much more along the lines of you should be athletic right you should be athletic and you should take care of your body and things like that and you should be able to compete in certain activities right you should be able to sing and actually carry a tune you should be able to solve mathematical problems and dazzle the people at a court party with your algebra i guess and then also you should be able to do a many other things but he's basically writing a guidebook on how you should act in the new Renaissance era as a Renaissance individual, right? How should you be more like Alberti? How should you demonstrate your education? How should you demonstrate your thought and theory and be so important that you actually are gaining people's attention? Now, that's a really important concept of this courtier in this book and stuff like that. But what about women? Where do they fit in all this, right? Like, so like, do women get a section of the courtier? Is there a guidebook for them? There was. Baldassar Castiglione actually did include things about women, except he also said that women should do all of these things, but also they have to be beautiful, which is like, right, nice, nice, Baldassar. Really appreciate you uh, really judging everything on the way that they look, right? Really good. So as we know, with, that, with however great the Renaissance is, sexism is still a really big thing during this time period, right? Like, for example, Leon Battista Alberti thought that women didn't deserve to be educated, right? Like, so, like, which is bananas. But the title of the book that Baldassar Castiglione is, like, wrote is still really important because this book is so important that it became basically, like, the common text on how you should educate your child if you were from a noble family, right? And so a courtier, what it is specifically, is it's a person that's been to court so much that they've caught the attention of a king, a queen, or a royal. And they've done it so many times that a king or a queen or a royal trusts their thoughts and ideas. And they can give advice to a king because that's how intelligent they are. So Baldassar Castiglione's educational text of Courtier is going to be a massively important text going forward. And it's going to kind of help establish some rhythms and basically curriculums to educational things in Europe during the Renaissance. But what good, but like what defines a good king? Like, we got a now a good courtier, but what makes the good king, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about that actually during class when I see y'all when you come back. So I'll see y'all then. Y'all have a good one.